Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Hero Hero Go Show. I am your host, Bo Ransdell. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks to everyone who is new to the show. There are definitely some of you out there. I've seen the numbers. I can prove this. Uh, so thanks very much for joining us. Um, this will be slightly different from the Sion Sono show we did in the last episode. That was just me talking to you about uh, the film Tag and trying to provide a little bit of information and context for that movie. This time around, we are beginning another series. We wrapped up The I, 1, 2, and 3 with Richard Glenn Schmidt uh, a few weeks ago. Now it is time to look at another uh, well-regarded series in Asian horror history. That series, of course, is One Miss Call, uh, the, the tale of spooky phone calls and voicemails. And there is no one I would rather get... Uh, a spooky call from then the the gentleman who's going to be joining me for the entire run of this uh mr derek bourgeois how are you sir i am very good Bo. it's been a long time coming i think because i actually you know back in the day when we first started the talk i was like did you do this movie yet can i come on this you know like but i think this is a perfect time for me to come on and this is actually a film uh I always wanted to talk about with somebody before, and you know, it was great that this actually was the first movie that I actually appeared on. So uh, that's good, and you know, I I seen two out of the three films out of the series, so I'm excited. You know, yeah, I'm in the same boat. I haven't seen uh, One Miss Call final yet, and as we were, we were talking before the show, there's One Miss Call and One Miss Call Two. Uh, then there's a television series that happened after one miss call two that is notoriously difficult to find. And I don't know that we're going to do much coverage other than to say that it exists because we can't really find it. And so <laughs> listeners out there, uh, if you are uh, a fan of this show and know how to get your, your filthy little mitts, on a copy of the one miss call limited series that aired in 2005 on Japanese television. I would very much love to see that. Um, but you know, we'll see you can, Hey, you can find me at uh, Bo B O at Legion podcasts.com. So if you run across such a thing or you have a line on it, give me a, give me a yell at that address and, uh, uh, we'll work something out. So, um, but yeah, I, I this is exciting, uh, not just because you're on, and and you're right, that was sort of an inevitability. It was just a matter of when. But talking about one miss call is something I've wanted to do for a while because one miss call is, I I've kind of avoided it because one miss call is is such a go to for me. And it mm -hmm. almost felt like too obvious a choice to really cover in, in detail, but covering the run of the series, it made me feel, I don't know, a little better. It helped me rationalize just watching a movie that I genuinely love, um, as opposed to watch something, you know, new and exciting and eh, that kind of thing. Um, I just, I, when, when did you first see One Miss Call? I mean, the, the movie originally came out in 2003, and I think I saw it maybe the next year. I'm not sure what year I seen it. I remember uh, you, you heard of Fear Net before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The no longer with us, I think. Yeah, yeah. They had like the the Comcast service with uh, Comcast for a while, where they had the on demand option, uh, and that's when I first saw it. It was on that uh, banner of the Fear Net network, and uh, yeah, because they had a lot of like J horror there. They, you know. Uh, I think I saw Juwan there originally first too, and yeah. there was a bunch of them. And uh, I think that was maybe a few years later after it came out. I'm not really too sure the exact year, but uh, yeah, I was like telephones that kill. <laughs> you know, it was great. Sure. <laughs> well, it, right, and it feels very J horror in that sense because you had you know VCRs with the ring. Here comes one missed call with telephones. Uh, you know, new newfangled cell phones are going to kill you now. Um, you had Pulse, which was sort of just computers and technology in general. Um, so there was a, and I don't think it was unique to Japan, but Japan had a very direct expression of that sort of technological anxiety 
of the late 90s and early 2000s. And I think that's one of the reasons that that J-horror wave hit the way it did is because it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, everybody is kind of slightly freaked out by the idea of cell phones, of this thing that connects you all the time to people, but also sort of isolates you in a lot of ways. And it, right, it, like, it, you know, it, just a lot of wrestling with uh, sort of existential concepts related to, to how – you know, technology was changing culture and, and especially a culture like Japan's that's thousands of years old, you know, some aspects of that culture are, you know, I mean, older than most countries by, by a fair stretch. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's interesting to examine sort of that wave of, of films. But, um, the thing I like about this, not to get too, uh, highfalutin about this Derek, because I don't, I don't want to get too high and mighty about one missed call. Mm -hmm. The thing that I like most about it is the first time I saw it, it scared the shit out of me. Yeah. I, uh, I don't want to get too much away or, or so far, but, uh, that scene in the hospital, that whole sequence, <laughs> Yeah, nightmare fuel. <laughs> it that's really scary. There's, it, I mean, we'll talk about some of the the scares in particular, but the thing I like about this movie, and I'll probably say it more than once on this episode, is that Takashi Miike with this film in particular just seemed to take the approach that Airplane does with jokes of just yeah. keep the scares coming, do them do them differently it's not just a bunch of jump scares it's not just creeping dread it's not just visuals it's not just gore it's everything it's everything this twisted little fuck could come up with and Mike is just brilliant at that like when he when he wants to be transgressive he can be with something like Ichi the Killer but then something like one missed call, it, it's just like every now and again, he's like, no, no, no. This is how you make a horror film. That was everybody paying attention to audition. That's, that's one way to do it. Here's a popcorn horror movie that is head and shoulders above most popcorn horror movies. You know, um, I, I just love it. So, uh, <laughs> putting our cards on the table there, I think is wise of just like, look, this is going to be a bit of, of a sloppery hand job, uh, for this movie, I think, but you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, whenever anyone ever asked me about this, cause you know, people ask Mickey directed this, but they're like, yeah, I'm not really, you know, cause is it like typical J horror? I was like, it is, but there's a lot of things that Miki does with it that makes it his own. And, you know, I always say this with, like, things like hair extensions to X-Day, of course, but Sono directed yeah. that, because th that's very j horror too. They are J-horror films in the sense where, you know, they are have the same beats as a J-horror film, but they're super well-directed films, and they have their own uh, techniques and bring their own voice into them, too, which I like. Yeah, I Sono I think is a great parallel to Mike in a lot of ways because they're they're both incredibly prolific at times and and they do a lot of weird stuff in between all the horror stuff and the genre stuff, you know, I, there are hip hop musicals and manga adaptations and all kinds of stuff for both of oh. these guys, you know. Oh yeah, y Yakuza Apocalypse. <laughs> that movie's nuts. <laughs> yeah, they're uh oh god, what is it called? Tokyo Tribe, I think is the Sono one that's the the manga yeah. musical adaptation. Um anyway, it, right, yeah, the the catalog, the filmographies of Sono and Mike are insane. The both yeah. in in volume and choice of projects uh i've long i keep saying takashi Miike works like he has made some kind of deal with the devil where if he is not on set one day he'll die yeah you know he just cannot ever not be making a film um which good for him i mean good for all of us quite frankly because the more that he puts out the more that we've we've we're going to be left with ultimately and it, as long as he gives me like a 13 assassins every five years or so, he's one of the greatest filmmakers that ever lived. Yeah, I agree. Like I'll take a 
terra firmers one day and then i'll take 13 assassins or blade of the immortal the other mm-hmm. you know? yeah oh for sure uh and then do <laughs> phoenix right ace attorney in, in between that's fine yeah i, I don't care Takashi Miike. you do what you want that's my my motto uh <laughs> let let Miike be Miike. that's what i say uh, all right, let's get into this movie, and and we're just gonna do some rough beats of it. But the the movie kind of opens with our our group of friends that we have here, our our victims, our pool of victims. Um, the main girl is Yumi, who is played by Ko Shib- uh, Shibasaki, um, who is probably best known by me at least for being in Forty Seven Ronin. Mm-hmm. And there's her friend Natsumi, uh, who is played by uh, Kazue Fukishi, who is Noriko from Noriko's Dinner Table, as well as being in Thirteen Assassins. Speaking of Sono and Miike, she she has walked between both of those worlds. Um, and this is uh, just to give it some vitals. Th- uh, Takashi Miike, this same year, he made Gozu. Oh, which. <laughs> Which is one of four movies uh, that he made, including The Man in the White Shirt and The Man in the White Shirt, uh, or The Man in White and The Man in White 2, both in the same year he directed. Yeah, Gozu, a.k.a. Twin Peaks with Milk. Gozu is a weird, weird movie, but it's uh, one of those that we'll probably get around to here. Um, Just, you know, because every now and again, you gotta you gotta stop and do the Mika weird ones. Where he's just like, hey, I'm going to go like happiness of the Katakuris for no good reason. Yes. Um, So anyway, like he's made so many incredible movies. Like I said, the thing I like so much about One Missed Call is it doesn't feel like he's trying to like drive anybody out of the room with this one. Like with Audition or Ichi the Killer or something like that. It's like, no, no, no. Have Have a good time. Get your popcorn. Have your soda. But it's still going to be traumatizing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's not. Yeah. It, it's not going to be come on the screen. But it's got to be awful in its own way. Anyway, so these friends are all uh, meeting up. Like Yumi, Natsumi. Uh, there is Yoko is uh, one of their other girlfriends. There's Kenji, who's one of the dudes that that they're with. Um, I can't remember the name of of the kind of hipster guy that they're all going to go to the lake house with, but. Um, he's not in it a ton anyway. He's just kind of yeah. there to, to yeah, <laughs> there to make everyone give everyone a phone number to to everybody. But um, so Yoko shows up late because she was at a funeral where a friend of hers died, and she and Yumi kind of sneak off to the bathroom at this restaurant so Yoko can change out of funeral clothes and get into street clothes, and she gets a, a phone call that. Yumi uh sees on on Yoko's phone and it it is the titular one miss call happens right away in the movie where uh she gets Yoko gets a call from her own phone number and the date is the day after tomorrow so she's getting a future message from herself and when she listens to it it's her saying oh no it's raining and then she screams yeah it's so good <laughs> yeah and she's like huh this isn't me right and then they cut to them sitting around the table and kind of talking about this and everybody's passing her phone around and they're like no this is you and she's like no it's not it's impossible and it's weird but they don't take it super seriously mm-hmm. and then we have the hipster dude who's like hey everybody uh Let's let's plan a trip to the lake. So make sure everybody's phone numbers are shared around because that's going to be important to the story. Uh, it's like COVID all over again. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but I, the thing I like about this scene is right off the bat, it goes for some nice creepy scares. Like uh, when one of the dudes is, is telling the story about uh, telling kind of a ghost story where he's like, and then she felt a hand on her shoulder and you see on Yumi's shoulder this hand like reach out and grab her this bony white hand and it's just a trick like the, it do, it doesn't exist it's not really there it's just me kind of firing a shot across the bow of like look I'm gonna go for everything 
Like, there's going to be a scare in almost every scene, so just get used to this. Oh, yeah. Uh, and there's uh, the look of the body under the ice. When, when Yoko is telling the story of how her friend died, her friend drowned. And they show this quick flash of the the body trapped under the ice. And it's pretty gnarly. Yeah. I, I, like, uh, I didn't realize that that what it was when I first seen this movie years ago. And then when I'm watching like on the new Blu-ray, like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it, it looks great. It does. It's really good. And then... Uh, the other thing I really like about this, and, and I think, I don't know who was the genius behind this, but the ringtone is that perfect kind of creepy where it sounds kind of normal, but there's something kind of off about it. It's, it's like a music box kind of tune or something. I, I love the, the ringtone for the, like the original movies. Uh, I hate the one they did in the well. Fuck the remaking all together. <laughs> we're not gonna get into. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're gonna pretend that doesn't exist. It's such a terrible remake of this movie. But yeah, um, but yeah. I, uh, but that ringtone that dun 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 dun. Oh, it's so good. And it starts off with that weird like bang. Yeah. For the whole tune, like it just sounds menacing, but there's something playful about it. And when they reveal what it actually is, and later in the movie, it's like. Wow, that, that must have been a fucked up TV show, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, what kind, what kind of horrifying, like tiddly wink bullshit is this? What or Teletubbies? That's what I was looking for. Um, yeah, it, but for an opening scene, it really does a good job of kind of setting everything up, but also not skimping on scares right away. Like this is not a slow burn movie. Th- this gets into it right right up front Mm -hmm. it's great yeah and so we we shift from that scene to meet yamashita who is sort of the hero of the movie along with uh, yumi and he is checking the mouth of this drowned corpse that yoko uh i think it's the same girl right isn't that who he's checking i Uh, think it may be because it'd be kind of weird i don't know when actually the scene takes place but it's It'd be kind of weird because why would he? Wouldn't he, the funeral have happened by this scene? I I wonder if it's a deal where they had a memorial and then this is right before she's going to be cremated or something. Maybe, uh, maybe. Anyway, it's a little unclear, and it's probably just some weird little cultural thing that that is not a perfect translation or something. But yeah, um, while Yamashita is sticking his fingers into this corpse's mouth. This old grizzled bald detective comes in smoking with sunglasses on inside. Oh, I love this dude. <laughs> I love everything that's going on here. I love everything about this. Um, I'm a, I love Asian Eli Wallach so much. <laughs> that's kind of, yeah, he is so good. And he he's like, hey, what are you doing with this girl's mouth? And also, aren't you the brother of Ritsuko? And Yamashita doesn't say anything and just kind of takes off. Um, just introducing us to him as being on the hunt and also showing us this grizzled old detective who throughout the movie is just going to be like, this ain't a ghost phone. That's his whole character. No, it's not. Uh, I don't want to give too much away a part two, but I do love that. He's like, yeah, it was a ghost phone later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spoilers for part two. Totally a ghost phone. Have you guys heard about the ghost phone? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, it's it, one of the better things about that sequel. Um, yeah. So Yoko, meanwhile, and, uh, and Yumi and Natsumi are kind of texting each other in class. Well, in fairness, Yumi's paying attention because she's kind of the good girl of the group. But Yoko and Natsumi are texting and fucking off. And uh, I think it's, yeah, it's it's Yoko who's like, yeah, I'm telling my current boyfriend that I'm busy because that dude we were having dinner with, Kenji, I think he's a tall drink of water. Yeah, she's like, you know what? Fuck my new boy, my old my old boyfriend. I'm going to go fuck this dude <laughs> pretty yeah. much. On it, yeah. In the words of Vanilla Ice, she is dropping the zero and getting with the hero, assuming <laughs> assuming Kenji is the hero in question. 
<laughs> pick six movie reference <laughs> yeah well it's just one of those things that sticks in your head and you've just got to say it until it's not there anymore um, yeah i hear you <laughs> <laughs> so um th- there's also thematically speaking this is an, a nice little touch where uh kind of like in halloween where the teacher is like hey what do you know what you know, what is it? Hawthorne is what she's asking about the teacher in Halloween. But in this one, the teacher is like, Hey, you two girls who have been fucking around with your phones, the whole class. Do you know what this, this lecture has been about? And Yoko has a real good recovery where she stands up and she says, Oh yeah, it's about how abuse spawns abuse. And the teacher looks kind of pissed off that she got it right. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's the gist of it. Sit the fuck down. I actually like that scene a lot because actually that line that Yoko says kind of has like an underlying theme of the underlying undertones of certain things that happen later in the movie. Yeah, it is upfront me saying like this is a movie about abuse. Yeah. And and I like again, like he makes movies that are about stuff and this doesn't get too bogged down in the subtext. It's really you know it's it's good for the plot and also it mean it you know it makes the movie about a thing yeah yeah exactly and you don't have to watch it like if you watch it like for the first time you probably won't even catch that right away but then on like rewatch you're like whoa that's like a like a future foretelling later yeah. on like on rewatch right yes it, you're absolutely right it, it's a nice bit of foreshadowing that when you're watching again you're like oh this movie is like it's Again, just head and shoulders above most popcorn horror where it's actually kind of smart and it it's telling like it's letting the audience know early on what to be on the lookout for. Mm -hmm. And so after after class, Yoko is out at night. Um, She's calling Yumi and says, um, hey, how about tomorrow you blow off class and we'll go shopping and stuff? And Yumi's like, no, 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 I'm a good girl. I can't do that. And then while they're on the phone, Yoko on her stroll home uh, has a couple of raindrops hit her fingers and she looks up and she says, oh no, it's raining. And Yubi has that flashback of like, oh, oh shit. Uh, That's what she said on that voicemail. And then all hell breaks loose. Just, just when the, the chain link fence starts to cut open, you're like, oh no. (laughs) <laughs> right. Cause you're like, what? So is she, here's what I, th- I thought the first time I saw this was, Oh, she's going to be thrown into this chain link fence and like, it's going to break her neck or it's going to kill her or something like that. No, no, no. <laughs> this thing pops open and she gets thrown with ghost force through this guardian fence so that she can land on a train that's moving below her. <laughs> But not before hitting like the electrical pole that powers the train. So it sparks, then she hits the train, then goes flying. Oh, it's so brutal. You know, like when you hear it later, like she wasn't even dead yet. <laughs> like what? Right. The, the fact that that is an element of all the murders is like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. They don't die right away. They ha- they suffer for a little bit. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> um <laughs> And the so, whole scene ends with like her severed hand just texting the next person because that's how the ghost passes on to its next victim. I, I kind of like that aspect. And that's a really cool way to end that scene. Dude, this severed arm dialing the next victim is one of the raddest things in this film for me. I love it. It is so, so metal. I uh, love it so much. And, and so now we cut to this funeral for Yoko. And some schoolgirls outside the funeral are gossiping about uh, how, like, she died all slow and painfully. Like, that's right away we get that information. Like, oh, yeah, she didn't die right away. Like, when they found her, she was still begging for help and then died because this movie has no sympathy or mercy for its characters at all. And (laughs) and Yumi overhears this and, and... she overhears them saying it's like the other girl. And she's like, what, what are you talking about? What other girl? And they say, well, let me ask you this. Let me answer your question with a question. Did your friend get a phone call from her own phone number? And Yumi's like the fuck? Yes, yeah, she did. 
And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rena, that girl who drowned, she got the same phone call and she knew you Yoko. And so it spread to Yoko's phone like a virus. And, uh, one of the schoolgirls is like, oh, yeah, it's a girl who died full of hate, and she goes through the phones of the victims to find the next one. And mm-hmm. and the scene kind of wraps up with uh, a look at Yamashita uh, kind of eyeballing this and following them, too. But it's kind of an exposition dump of, hey, here's what's happening in the movie. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty good, and it's creepy. It is. It's it's really interesting. Uh I, I just love how you could tell this whole girl squad is like a clique because they're all wearing the same outfits that are opposite from anybody else in the school. Yeah. And you know, they're like, yeah, you know, this is just a curse. It just happens. Like, like it's a normal thing in Japanese right. <laughs> in Japan. Like, there's always a curse, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Look, my cousin died too. A different curse, but still a curse. <laughs> yeah. Didn't, didn't have a phone or nothing. Got a VCR <laughs> and popped in a tape. Seven well, days my, later, fucking my, dead. My my sister got went into a house and died. You know, <laughs> right? Just taking care of some old lady at a house. The next thing you know, she's missing for months now. I don't know what the hell happened to her. Every time we go near the house, we hear croaking. I'm not going in that joint. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So Yoko, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Yumi, uh, meets up with Kenji, the, the would be boyfriend for Yoko. And he's, he is definitely not psychologically well at this point. Um, he's very nervous. He's real neurotic, which is right because he got a call from Yoko's phone. And he's like, you know, this is pretty stupid, right? And Yumi's like, I don't know. This seems pretty legit. And he's like, no, 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 it's not legit. Because, I mean, I got one of those calls and nothing happened to me yet. And he shows Yumi his phone. And she's like, this is like five minutes from now. <laughs> like, what? what are you doing yeah. up here? And he got <laughs> he got the same kind of call where he got a voicemail of just him uh, screaming, uh, hearing something screaming. And... Uh, the elevator door, they're on top of, uh, this kind of like open air restaurant kind of cafe deal. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, the elevator opens up for them to go down and it's just like a spirit world or something. It's just inky blackness, but there's some business going on in there too. Yeah. uh, (laughs) Like, like, like if you watch this, like on the old DVD, you couldn't really make it out, but there's like more like things going on inside that elevator and like the new transfer that they did. And you can see it clearer too. And it's like, Whoa, what the fuck is that? Yeah. Yeah. It looks really good. By the way, I think both of us were watching this new one miss call up the arrow, uh, Blu-ray trilogy, man. It looks good. It's a a, 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 two in particular, like one looks really good, but there were moments in two where it was like, man, this looks great. It's not my favorite in this series by any stretch, but it looked real nice. Um, but yeah, this elevator sequence, it, it's almost like they're like snakes or something moving in there, but you can't ever quite make it out. It's really a nice effect. And then Kenji just gets sucked into the elevator and, uh, falls to his death. Uh, well, but not right away, of course, you know, because the curse is such that he falls it you know has every fucking bone broken and just lies there moaning but before he gets sucked in the elevator you hear this and then he gets sucked in yeah it's a little hint to what's coming up yeah so, uh, yeah and i like in very j horror fashion like this is like you know pulse and the ring and all that stuff of this time where it's like okay we're going to establish this creepy curse thing that's happening and now the mystery is what's going on how do we stop it and yeah. and so we know kind of what's going on but we don't know this the spirit behind it and that becomes much of the thrust of the movie um especially when like yumi is then questioned by this detective, uh, the or old grizzled detective, Japanese, Japanese Eli Wallach, as you said, um, where he's like, look, this isn't a bunch of haunted phone bullshit. Every death is explainable is how he puts it. 
And Yumi's like, I don't know about this. This seems pretty ghostly. And he's like, no, 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 no. And so Natsumi and Yumi decide that they're going to have a sleepover. And Natsumi gets uh, a call on her phone. It's uh, She gets another curse call. And this time, though, Derek, it's not a message. It's a picture. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a picture of Natsumi with a wall behind her and, like, the crown of a head and fingers are and coming it, around the corner. And it moves. Yeah, and, and it, it, right. And it peeks out like a little, hello. <laughs> and <laughs> Toasty. Yeah. <laughs> Curse calling. And, and, and not to me naturally freaks out like you do when ghost pictures move on your phone. And, uh, Yumi, uh, is, you know, obviously, uh, upset as well. She goes to find not me the next, uh, or she and not me go the next day to a phone store, um, where they make sure, that they erase her phone, Natsumi's phone, and recycle it to try to, like, hey, we're going to get rid of this uh, whole problem by getting rid of the phone. Um, but not before. Oh, I did skip one little scene here, which I really enjoyed, where uh, Yumi is, is at school with Natsumi, and she yeah. finds Natsumi surrounded by a bunch of girls that are like, hey, get your number, get get my name out of your phone. Get my name out of your phone now, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to rip your head off. <laughs> right. And and uh, Natsumi is obviously upset by all this. And she's like, fine, fine. I know you all want to. And I love that one girl that's like, look, I'm just, just in case, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's I, this isn't personal. I just don't want to die because one every now and again we text. Like, I haven't heard from you in like two and a half weeks. And I'm not... <laughs> yeah. I'm not prepared to die for you. All, all our ex boyfriends are like, please take your number out of your phone right now. <laughs> Man, I would, it follows that shit up. I would, every ex girlfriend that did me wrong. Like, yes. I wonder if, I, if it goes by recency. I'll even give them a call. Hey, <laughs> just me again. How you doing? <laughs> if you exactly. get a call, if you get a call from your own phone, be sure you answer. Yeah, uh, <laughs> definitely. I have a few exes I would do that. <laughs> yeah i'm not above it so so uh there's also after they uh go to the phone store and get rid of the phone on their way back to i think it's not some places where they're going they get kind of beset by a camera crew uh that's like hey we want to we heard about this curse thing and we want to put you on television with a medium who's going to provide an exorcism for your curse on live television and you're going to be there uh, and we'll have the cameras on you at the time of the message. So we'll see what's up. And Yumi's like, this is a terrible idea. Don't do any of this. <laughs> this, this sounds like a, an em at best embarrassing at worst, m like fatal. Because you were dealing with supernatural forces, and you know who's not great at dealing with supernatural forces? Television producers. Nope. <laughs> it is not, not in their wheelhouse. So, uh, Yumi is making some headway, but then Natsumi's phone rings again. <laughs> it, it, like, it has come back to her out of nowhere. She opens it up. It's another picture. Uh, the same set and everything. Only now the girl is closer and moving again and stuff. And she screams, throws the phone and kind of understandably is like, Hey, you said you got a medium that you think can fix this. All right. Sorry, Yumi. Gotta go. Yeah. I gotta go see the exorcist. Fuck this shit. <laughs> I mean, right. Like there's at least somebody that's telling you like, we've got a fix for this. We can keep you alive. And that's all I would be worried about. Certainly. Yeah, exactly. And while they're taking Natsumi away, then uh, Yamashita shows up, uh, our, our guy who was, you know, poking around in dead girl's mouths earlier. And this time Yumi chases after him 
And they finally have this moment where they kind of compare nodes where Yumi tells them all about Natsumi and, and the message she's been getting. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All these calls are happening. Like the calls to the next victim are happening after the death of the first victim or the previous mm-hmm. victim. And that his own sister, Rid- uh, Ritsko, that the detective mentioned earlier, died in a fire. Uh, but again, not quickly like she got terribly burned taken to a hospital where the way he puts it is the doctor said it was a miracle that she was even alive it was no miracle like she just suffered until she died yeah and and also found this red candy stuffed in her mouth so here's another piece of the mystery and they track down a a call from his sister's cell phone to a hospital where they see an ad for the show that knots me is going to be on. And while they're kind of in this hospital and it's sort of a dead end, they don't really get much information, but while they're there, Yumi overhears a kid sucking on an inhaler for asthma, you know, one of those quick, quick, and and sucks on it and she's like hey that's the noise i heard right before kenji got sucked into the the elevator mm-hmm. and so y- yamashita says hey i think we should take a break a break and go to the apartment of the weirdest dude i know <laughs> that's uh, that's a great way to get a woman <laughs> yeah when you first, let's go meet this weird dude i know let's go. yeah here let me let me tell you this internet pal of mine who has r- photographic records of all these bodies brought in and so they go to his place where he is scrolling through death photos and they're like yeah this doesn't look right this doesn't look right we're looking for somebody that maybe would have needed an inhaler or something and he's like, hey, what about this girl, this 10-year-old girl who died of an asthma attack named uh, Mimiko Mizunuma? Mm-hmm. And they're like, hey, that sounds that sounds like uh, a pretty good lead. And they also find in the phone the phone number to Marie Mizunuma, who is the mother of Mimiko. Yep. And so while they're kind of put, like, hey, we got a real lead, we, we kind of know – who maybe the spirit is it's, it may be the mother, maybe the daughters, but we're, we're getting somewhere. And while they're putting all this together, this fucking weirdo starts taking pictures of Yumi. Yeah. This is the weirdest scene ever. This is like the guy from hair extensions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, uh it, I love yeah. that dude. Oh, it's so funny. Um, <laughs> But he starts taking pictures of her and then takes a picture of Yamashita as well. And he says, oh, I'll have these on file just in case something happens to you two. Oh. Yeah. Fucking taking death photos of him while while in his apartment. Uh, You know, like you do. Yep. (laughs) And yumi there's a really cool scene here uh it's not so much the information that you're getting but i really like the way this is presented where it's yumi calling natsumi to tell her like hey we're kind of at zero hour you're about to go on television please don't do this but they cut from yumi's end of the conversation to this other guy on the phone that is saying totally different stuff. And you're like, wait, is she talking to him? She's talking to not to me, but why are we focused on this guy on the phone? And then you realize that it's a television producer who is leading you into not dressing room where she's on the phone with Yumi. Yeah. It's just a neat little director trick that I, I really like in this movie. It, again, there's no reason to do it other than for me to just kind of show off a little bit. But I'm totally fine with that. That's, you know, that, that Spielberg does it all the time. I like a director that has some flair. Yeah, I, I like that scene too a lot. Yeah, it's really good. And not to me, of course, is like, look, I just, I, I understand where you're coming from. I just want to live. And I, again, totally understandable. 
yeah, it, it's totally like she's just trying to do what she thinks is right at the moment. You know, she might not know if this might work, but hey, it's better than not trying, you know? Right. And she kind of asks Yumi, like, what, what's your suggestion? What, what should we do? And Yumi is telling her, like, well, we found these records of Mimiko and her sister Nanako was in the hospital a lot. And we think maybe the mother was abusing her kids. And she's like, uh, yeah, great. How does that help me right now? And they're like, eh, well, not so much right now. But we really think we're on to something. <laughs> we might have something, you know, but we don't know yet. You know, it's like a Scooby-Doo episode at this point. Maybe. Right. <laughs> yeah. we Like, we know that definitely Farmer Henson is involved. We just don't know <laughs> how. Uh, those meddling kids. Right. So they, these meddling kids go to the hospital where Nanako was taken a couple of times. And they meet a caseworker who's like, yeah, it was kind of weird because this little girl was coming in all the time. But at the same time, like the mother was attentive. She was the one who called us in most cases. It was either her or sister Mimiko who was calling us. Um, so, you know, but yes, it looks bad on the surface, but based on all our investigation, like this mother wasn't doing anything wrong. And it's uh, Yumi who's like, maybe it's Munchausen by proxy, which was incredibly popular as a thing in movies in the 2000s. Yeah. <laughs> it, like, it popped up a lot for some weird reason. Like, that was a thing that hit the zeitgeist the world over, where it was like, wait a second, that's a thing? Munchausen by proxy? Well, fuck, I'm putting that in this screenplay. Yeah, um, let's do it. Why not? <laughs> and, and for those who don't know, Munchausen by proxy is just a... Um, a, a, a sort of psychological psychological condition where a caregiver will hurt a child or, uh, you know, a, like an elderly patient or something like that, um, to making them sick enough to require attention so that you can be sort of the good Samaritan and swoop in and nurse them back to health and that kind of thing. And it, it's sort of craving the attention of being, a, a savior to a child or something. Uh -huh. And the caseworker is like, Oh, well you've been, you've been reading psychology today. Yes, that is a possibility. I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah. You see Yumi's really, really into this conversation too, which I think does that reveal happen before they go to the movie theater? I mean the TV studio or, um, it happened. No, no, no. It happens kind of like the full reveal happens later at the hospital. Uh -huh. But like, there's some hints along the way. Like they talk about how she doesn't like to look through peepholes because she's afraid she's going to see something scary. And there, there are definitely elements of abuse peppered in, but you don't really get until she has the conversation with Yamashita later um that like oh she is the victim of abuse which is of course what what the case is yeah so one of the reasons yes that she is so knowledgeable about all this stuff and she's like a social worker major like it's clear she her life is sort of coming to terms with the abuse she suffered as a child mm -hmm. and wanting to make up for that in a lot of ways and and so forth and they, uh, Yumi and Yamashita go to this Japanese Eli Wallach again, and they're like, Hey, here's what we found about, you know, the Mizunuma family. Also, Natsumi is about to go on television. We think this is a bad idea. Can you do something? And he's like, Look, I don't investigate crimes that haven't happened yet. What am I, a precog? <laughs> Minority report <Yeah>. reference. <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah and there he's just he blows them off and they're like all right fine and then comes kind of the big centerpiece of the movie oh it's my favorite part it's, it's fucking so good like there's just nothing not to like about any of this it's the the not television appearance um 
I don't, it's difficult to kind of describe. It it reminded me a lot of Ghost Watch in a lot of ways, like the end of Ghost Watch, but like the the medium tries an exorcism and when the time comes and the phone rings, he just gets blasted with Ghost Force through like the wall of the set and a thunderstorm starts happening inside this television studio and, and it's just chaos. It's nuts, like, you know, and then, you know, uh, uh, the girl ends up pulling, like, one of the sheets that was on, like, one of the walls, and then the fucking reveal is, that was the wall in the photo the whole time. (laughs) It's like, whoa. Yeah, it was a wall inside the studio, and so Natsumi uh, meets her ultimate end, which is to literally twist to death. It's so good. As her body and bones just start cracking, as her her limbs start contorting in directions they are not supposed to. Oh, it's so good. Right, and and the big guitar solo ending of this is that her head just twists off her body. You don't see it. You just see her head hit the floor, and then her bo- her headless body walking dumbly behind her before it collapses oh Oh. (laughs) it is nuts and this whole scene is like 10 minutes long yeah we're not even doing it justice you just gotta see this movie just for this scene guys yeah yeah yeah, it it, i mean like i said it's a big center it's like the centerpiece action scene of a mission impossible movie or something where it's just like man you got to see this shit that they do on a mountain with a helicopter. It's crazy. It's it, that kind of thing for horror fans of like, you got to see what they do with this whole exorcism in a, in a TV studio. It's so good. And the best thing about it, it's all live on TV. <laughs> right. I, and that's the other thing I really like about this is it goes for that scope of just like, yeah, this is a nation is watching this on television and life will never be the same. No, you know, it's, oh, it's so good. And, and to the second film's credit, they totally acknowledge that, yes, this was a thing that happened on television. Nobody is nearly freaked out enough about it, but they acknowledge that it happened. And well, it's, well, it's like when the school girls are like, yeah, we had curses, you know, right. Man, fucking curses. We just can't shake a stick. It, it's like, it's like when watching Godzilla films. Yeah. Godzilla's a thing. Yeah. Right, there's a monster that swims in the ocean and occasionally comes up on an island and blows the shit out of stuff. It happens. It happens. Uh, right. God, <laughs> and that's why everybody's like, oh, Godzilla's here? God damn it. All right. Terry. Terry. Yeah, it's Godzilla. Call Mothra. Let's yeah. do this. Get, yeah, get the ball rolling on that. It's going to be. It's gonna take the twin singing to get Mothra into this. Yeah, it's the Mariah Carey of the monster universe. I. I keep, I had a whole conversation recently with some friends of mine who aren't really familiar with like, you know, the, the Toho monster movies and stuff, but we're talking about, you know, the new, uh, Godzilla versus Kong movie. And I was saying, you know, what they get wrong in all of these is what a lazy bitch Mothra is because yeah. in every single movie Mothra just lays around, not wanting to do shit until Every villager is singing and dancing. We got the twins in there. Like somebody has shown up new to explain to Mothra. No, no, no. This time it's super serious. Like every Ghidra is about to destroy everything on this planet. And Mothra is just like, (sighs) all right. There is never a point where Mothra is initiating anything. Uh, And that's what I love so much. It's that kind of character, and I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but only a little bit, and and that's what I love so much about those movies, and that's kind of what I was trying to communicate. The, the, the worst example of that, though, is Sea Monster, where they legitimately sing to her like the whole movie before she goes and saves the villages it's, from the other island. <laughs> I love it so much. I love that so, so much. I love how I love how hard it is to get Mothra out of bed. I, she's like i'm not helping these fucks they got kidnapped i don't give a fuck pray for me bitch she's yeah. like a diva she's and like the mariah carey of fucking- absolutely the diva and and constantly is like you know hey mothra can you go tell godzilla and rodan that we need them to work together for a few minutes 
Ugh. All right. I, uh, it is just the most reluctant save in the day this side of Big Trouble in Little China. You know, I, I love it so much. Um, it's great. Yeah, Mothra is the Jack Byrne of monsters. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the, the, the capper on the scene uh, at the television studio is the candy rolling out of the mouth of the decapitated head. <laughs> and then Yumi gets uh, a phone call of her own. Yeah. And so, it's time. yeah, the clock is ticking and it's time to, and that's kind of the halfway point of the movie in the back end of this is now Yamashita and Yumi have to save Yumi. Yeah. The thing about the, before we go any further, the thing that this movie's almost two hours long, but this flies by. Yeah. This scene happens at like the one hour mark and it really juices the movie. Yeah. You, not that I think it was slow to begin with. Cause like we, we were talking about in the upfront, like this movie starts with some little scares in the first few minutes. Like it doesn't goof off. Uh, it gets to the business of being a horror film right away. And when you hit this television studio thing, it's like, this is the crescendo of every other horror movie, but we've got a whole second half, which is just as good. Yeah. It feels like it's two movies split into one because the first half is like, you know, this like, the, like we said, it was like a, more of like the straightforward horror stuff. But then the second half is like the mystery of trying to find out what the horror is. And then, you know, you get a little scare scare fest finale too you know yeah because so the, the breather here is that we have yumi and yamashita and this is where we have the the conversation about her mother uh kind of abusing her grandmother and the reason that and as well as as yumi like she wasn't discriminatory in that respect but um the reason that Yumi doesn't like peoples is her mother made her look through one to see her grandmother, her protector swinging from a noose. Yeah. That, that's, I would not like peoples either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's hardcore. That and, lady was a piece of shit. <laughs> right. And like I said, that's the breather coming out of the television sequence. Is like, oh, here's this old woman hanging from a, a rafter. And yeah, this, this movie's dark. <laughs> it, yeah. And, and all right. And so then we go to, we finally track down the, the Mizunuma home, which is still abandoned. And I, I like the detail of the, the guy who's uh, the superintendent or whatever, who's like, yeah, we got to refinish all the floors. You don't have to take your shoes off. You can walk wherever you want in this joint. Um, and they, they go inside. The place is kind of a wreck, but it's a wreck the way that any house with kids is, where it's a lot of toys and crayons and papers and shit all over the place. Um, inside, they find some, like, bills and cut-off notices and also a torn-up picture of the family that Yumi is kind of slowly reassembling. And there's this great shot in this scene of... A cup, a cupboard behind Yumi, and uh -huh. you just see ghostly hands start to come out of it and start to inch forward, like to reveal itself. And then Yamashi is like, "Hey, Yumi, what's that behind you?" And like, not afraid, just kind of looking at this open cupboard. And she turns around, and there's nothing there. It's one of those like, "Hey, this didn't have to be a scare." But when Yumi turns around, of course, she loses her shit. Uh, she's like, oh, my God, it was a ghost. And then Yamashita checks it out. It turns out it's not a ghost. Well, it was. But what the ghost was getting at is there's a uh, a video camera uh, in there. And uh, Yamashita is like, hey, this is another lead. How about you go home and I'm going to keep investigating? Uh, which happens for the remainder of the film is him constantly telling her, like, would you please just go home? I will take care home. of this. Yes. Go to your home. <laughs> uh, but that ghost in the cupboard is so good. I love that it stare. Is. It um, is. It's really good. And so Yamashita tracks down Nanako, 
the the surviving uh, or or the one member of the Mizunuma fam- family that we can get our hands on. But Nanako is no good because she doesn't talk anymore. But uh, we do get a an introduction to her toy teddy bear, which plays uh, a kids TV song theme, which is the music that we hear during the ghostly phone calls. La 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 la. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I think it's kind of a riff on the like I love you, you love me, but it's just twisted enough to end up in like some dark carnival version. Uh, it's it, it's really again all the little details of this movie are just perfect. Um. Oh. <laughs> so Yumi then discovers that the old hospital where Mimiko died is still there, even though it's abandoned now. And so she calls uh, Yamashita and he's like, great, go the fuck home. Would you? And I'll go check out this spooky hospital. That doesn't seem like the place you ought to be right now. And she's like, okay. And then hangs up and immediately goes to the spooky hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Where, like, inside, she starts to see, like, visions of Yamashita and is chasing him around and stuff. Uh, but it's it's kind of leading her into the depths of, of this hospital. And there's, uh, like you were saying earlier, this whole sequence is her kind of wandering around the hospital with all these little creaks and glimpses and stuff like that. It's incredibly creepy. It is. Uh, it's great. Yeah. Oh. Definitely one of my favorite, just again, coming off that television sequence, we're now just thrown almost immediately after a little bit of exposition thrown right back into the cauldron where it's just Takashi Miike, like cruelly running you through the fun house. Yeah. Like the whole scene where she's just kneeling on the floor and then you just see like this slow hair coming down from behind her, like from the ceiling. And it's like, oh, mwah. Man, that ghost walking on the ceiling behind her is one of the most rocking ghost images ever. It is so good. Um, and the whole end of this movie is just one big fun house. It's one of the reasons I love it so much is that it's it's just like we're going to do scare after scare after scare. It we We finally do get Yamashita in the building. And... By this point, her phone just starts counting down to uh, <laughs> zero from a minute of like, you're going to die in one minute, 59, 58. And Yamashita is screaming. Yumi is crying. It is just mayhem. And then Yamashita looks over and sees this corpse hand holding a phone sticking out of this tub <laughs> or something. And he's like, wait a second. I bet that has something to do with this. And let's go let's ahead. Go look at this. Let's go look at this. You know, yeah. Oh, uh, this whole fucking corpse is like this. Gave me fucking nightmares for years after this movie, dude. It. So he grabs the phone and he like yells stop, and everything kind of stops for a second, and everything seems like it's cool. And then this corpse gets up and this movie just takes a step into Fulci territory for a minute as this zombie mother just starts peeling apart as she walks like very slowly towards Yumi, who naturally is screaming her full head off. Um, Yamashita tries to drag her out of the room, but he gets ghost thrown out of there and the door slammed shut. So it's just Yumi and this like peeling corpse that's walking across the room towards her. We should also add, this is the corpse of Marie, right? This is that. Marie Mizunuma. And she finally grabs Yumi and starts choking her. And, uh, Yumi, sees her mother in a flash and 
like it's kind of the big emotional moment of the movie where uh Yumi is sort of recognizing and forgiving her mother and coming to a place of sort of forgiveness of of the abuser in the past so that she can release and and so forth. Uh, meanwhile, weirdly, Yamashita's ghost sister shows up in the hallway outside to say, every one of us has a different sky, and then disappears. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I guess. I, I did like that the corpse was actually crying, too. That actually kind of made me feel like, oh. Yeah, so all of this is is leading us to believe that ultimately Yumi makes peace with her own past, which settles the spirit of Marie Mizunuma to rest. Yamashita finally breaks into the room where he finds Yumi literally cradling the corpse of this dead mother like an infant, you know, that yeah, cycle it, it, of it, mother and child is reversed here. Yeah. It's like the, it's like the end scene of relic. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And it and it I think it in the same way it is getting at the idea of this cycle of generational horror, you know, in that one you can't get away from it. In this one you can sort of forgive your way out of the cycle. And yeah. that's what Yumi has done is she's released all that pain and anger and that kind of thing. And and thus uh, also put the spirit of Marie uh, Mizunuma to rest. And then... I think it's going to be a happy ending. But... Right. Like, this is where the movie, you, you would think, would end. But uh, we get another moment with our old grizzled detective and one of his uh, partners, a younger cop, who's like, yeah, 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 we found the this phone uh, on this rotting corpse inside that's been gone at least six months and every victim's phone number was on this phone and the detective is just like god damn it it was a ghost phone uh, son of a bitch you got me ghost phone sorry everybody egg on my face ghost phone yeah. <laughs> and, um they uh also Yamashita gets a call saying that they've got something from Nanako's institution where she's uh, being housed uh, to show him. And the old grizzled detective is like, yeah, 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 you can go. I'll, I'll make sure that Yumi gets home safely. This time I promise you, we will actually take Yumi home. And so Yamashita takes off to go find a tape, a videotape that has been found among Nanako's things. That is from like a hidden camera. And it shows Nanako being tortured, not by her mother, but by Mimiko. And what we learn is that Mimiko was the one who was uh, hurting well, you, Nanako yeah, yeah. To, to get the attention. And she would give Nanako one of these red candies every time she heard her. As sort of a, like, hey, you know, th you're getting something out of this, too. And uh, also, uh, you know, the mother, went, Marie, when she walks in and sees Mimiko hurting Nanako and realizes for the first time, hey, all these trips we've been making to the emergency room, this little devil child <laughs> has been responsible for all of this. Uh -oh. Mimiko starts to have an asthma attack. And Marie is just like, you know what? This Fuck feels, you. yeah, this <laughs> feels an awful lot like a problem that's going to solve itself. Uh, uh, so she just watches as Mimiko dies. Hence the the origin of the curse. Yeah, and and oh, also this stupid bear is playing its song while Mimiko dies, which is why that's the the ringtone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really gruesome. Like seeing a child choke to death on screen is really something. Yeah, yeah it kind of reminded me, like of the Zelda scene when Zelda dies in Pet Cemetery a little bit. Yeah, it's yeah. that kind of disturbing. Like even though this child is terrible, like part of you wants her to die, 
but also you're watching a 10 year old girl choke to death on screen. Yeah. Uh, it's something. Anyway, so the end of this movie is Yamashita rushing to Yumi's place um, which has been completely Dana Barretted in the meantime, where ghost shit has been happening left and right. Uh, and uh, to the point where Yumi sees Mimiko as a ghost coming at her and she screams. But by the time Yamashita gets there, Yumi is just on the couch like, hey, uh, how was that? And he's like, huh, you're never going to believe what I found. It turns out that mimiko kind of a nut job and she's like huh huh how about a big old hug yamashita and he's like you know that sounds just about right after the day we've had nope <laughs> yeah. so they embrace and then he looks down because there's some blood dripping onto the floor and he realizes that yumi who is now possessed by mimiko has stabbed him in the gut and so he sees her smiling face as he passes out and has this dream vision of him saving Mimiko, like giving her the inhaler when she's choking on the floor. But then he wakes up and he's just, he's actually been stabbed and he's in the hospital and he's like, Oh, what in the hell happened? And then looks over and there's Yumi smiling at him. Mm -hmm. and also uh she has scissors <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is not a great sign and she kisses him and then pushes a red candy into his mouth from hers she has a new play thing that's right and there's a moment where we see him kind of sucking on this candy uh as she giggles and a shockingly upbeat song about separate skies plays that I'm still not sure I understand the metaphor of these separate skies in this movie, but mm. yeah, yeah, that, that's a little because even like that scene before the hospital scene actually opens up with a nice big blue sky. I too. yeah, right. So I think it has something to do with that. There's some hidden meaning behind that. that hell, we might not even ever figure out it's something that Mike probably hid for us you know yeah i i don't totally get that it's the one thing that has, has kind of eluded me in this movie like i feel like everything else is i'm pretty dead on with but that one i'm like i don't know about the uh, about the this uh this different skies thing but but yeah that's the end of one miss call uh the og 2003 film and uh it's, man it's a bad it's a it's banging J Hor at its finest, in my opinion. Yeah, it's. I think maybe Juwan is my favorite of this era. Uh, just because that was sort of my gateway drug in a lot of ways, but One Miss Call is right up there for me as far as if you want something that is going to both be the like example the i the platonic ideal, if you will, of a j horror film one miss call is right up there but it's also so much more than that much like juan is where it's like yeah J juan's as j horror as it comes but also it's kind of brilliant yeah i think one miss call would probably be a better gateway j horror film before you show them juan though in that sense yeah where you know you know because i know a lot of people have a little bit like because juan's like a non-linear storyline and stuff and you know I know you got you and Dave Z did that episode back in the day where you actually put it all in order, but you have to have context that that movie's nonlinear when you're going into it too. So I think more this one's more of a, like a gateway one where I could see like, hey, you want to check out a J horror film? Hey, check out One Miss Call. That might be a good one to start with, you know? Oh, for sure, and you know, worth pointing out a couple of fun notes about the movie itself. Uh, in terms of the context of, of that wave of J-horror, um, you know, there are some similarities it shares with things like, like Juwan, where abuse is kind of at the source of the curse. Mm -hmm. and, and you also see that in, you know, tons of films, even, um, 
Oh, I'm I'm totally blanking now. What is the old movie about uh the Japanese cat ghost? Oh, uh Kuroneko? Kuroneko, yeah, is all about the same thing of like a, you know, a woman who and her daughter who are raped and murdered. And it's always this kind of like here's this moment of abuse or 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 murder or tragedy and at that point the curse is unleashed you know yeah and so it it definitely has that in common with uh, a lot of those films um w- there's a nice thing that uh got pointed out for me which is at the end of the movie when y- yamashita shows up and yumi has been possessed she is wearing a white dress and has her hair down which is you know as we've talked about on this show any number of times long white dress long black hair pale face that is the stereotypical ghost in japan has been for hundreds of years yeah and so it's nice that oh she's dressed like a ghost in this scene um also it follows in the tradition uh set forth by a lot of movies from the 50s and 60s when japan made the transition into mostly color films where Red is often the otherworldly and green is the earthly. And if you watch this movie, particularly that television studio stuff, like you'll see the ghost lit in red a lot and you'll see Natsumi in green. Um, and it happens oh. a number. There's also some of that in the hospital scenes as well. Um, yeah, that, that's actually funny you say that because, you know, uh, I was, you know, actually another one that was on Fairnet all the time was the the hospital horror J horror movie Infection. Oh and yeah, it plays yeah. With, and it plays with those two colors a lot. And and now that I know that, it, it, I kind of want to watch that one again too. I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, I, again, at our best on Hero Hero Go Show, you are entertained and you actually learn something about these movies. Um, like for example, this uh, much like. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, oh shit. What is the series I was trying to think Oh, the ring series? Um, this was based on a novel. Uh, this one by, uh, Yasushi Akimoto is the author who is, uh, is credited on this and he's kind of credited on the later films as well. And it may just be because of the original novel. I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, uh, there also a little tidbit of, of knowledge for you. Uh, a lot of people in Japan, a lot of critics, um, characterize this as being a very, uh, sharp critique of the Keitai, Keitai rather Keitai phone culture, um, which was essentially, again, you know, it was one of the technological fears, but very specifically, it was about people getting cell phones and sort of living on their cell phones, which is, you know, something that is also still a, uh, a social uh, question, if not problem. Um, but it was one of the first films that, that dealt with that very specifically and not just kind of the broad idea of technology. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like uh, even at the time, even though, this movie was not super well regarded. It, it kind of a lot of the critique of the movie, I think, was that it felt very familiar and wrote. Um, yeah. In terms of its structure, I would argue that, hey, man, just because uh, you've seen Romeo and Juliet doesn't don't mean you've seen every version of Romeo and Juliet. And when somebody does it right. It's very cool, and when somebody does this formula right, I think it is also very cool. Yeah, I agree with that. Um. Anyway, what what other thoughts do you have on on this original one miss call? I uh, I know I've been gushing about it, <laughs> so apologies, but I love it. Nah, man. Uh, yeah, it's one of my favorites. Uh, you know, I don't. You know, I'm probably in the same boat. Like Juon or like Ringu are probably my first go tos, but that's like picking one of your favorite children. You know, I, one of his call is no slouch in that department. It's a great film, and you know, greatly directed by one of the masters of this genre of J- Japanese cinema in general. Mike holds no punches. 
you know, and it's a great, like, like I said, I just pick up little things here and there on rewatches of this movie every time. And I appreciate that this movie for that, you know, like on my first watch, I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. No. Oh, this lady's hanging from the thing. I didn't understand there was like an abuse angle when I first saw this. Cause you know, I was a younger lad when I first seen this movie. But now that I'm grown a little bit more. I'm like, Oh, this is kind of like a thinking man's J horror movie in a sense where, you know, you still have fun with it, but there's little things and hints of it where you could build and build and exorb it. I love that about this movie. The color palettes are great in it, and it has some great scary sequences that still kind of chilled me. Like when that fucking lady starts walking, I'm like, you know, and we didn't even talk about that. Yamashita is like this hits her with an axe. I'm like thinking that's a house by the cemetery reference. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know? no, it, it, it's there is no doubt in my mind in that sequence that that's me gave tipping his hat to Fulci. There is no doubt in my mind. And I love that about that because you know me because we did some of those lists of legends. Is, there might be a few Fulci's when I'm around on, but you yeah, know, you know, yeah, but, uh, yeah, great movie, love it. Yeah, it, it truly is. If you're listening to this show and you've never seen One Miss Call, this is one of those essential viewings. Like you have to see One Miss Call if you're interested in, you know, Japanese horror specifically and Asian horror in general. It's just one of the touchstones. It's one of, certainly one of my favorites, but it was hugely influential. Um, you know, it spawned two sequels in a television series. That's how good it was. That's how popular it was. Uh, and it was, it was a very popular movie, not just uh, in, in the home country of Japan, but uh, when it hit the States on uh, home video and so forth, it was, uh, it was very popular as well. Um, yeah, every yeah every video store I used to go to always had copies of this one. Like you would try to look for like Juwan or something, yeah. or like Ringu, they they'd be out of stock. But there's always, I even had my still my DVD set, which was from Tokyo Shock, which is actually not a really bad set for even our DVD set. But you know, Tokyo Shock did what they did, you know. But uh, it's still popular enough to have those. You can see those everywhere still. Yeah. Yeah, and I I can't stress again, uh, or can't stress enough, rather, how good that Arrow Blu-ray set is. It's really nice, and I haven't I haven't dug into all of these special features, but what I have looked at have uh, have been substantial and very good. Uh, I can I can pretty unreservedly recommend it at this point, uh, having not watched the the third Blu-ray yet, but uh, or the third film. Um, at any rate, uh, I think that is going to wrap us up on one missed call, uh, the the OG. And man, I'm a little reluctant. I I hate to see it go because I know I know the next movie we're going to talk about isn't as good. Yeah, there's some problems in that one for sure. It's been a while since I watched that one. I'm going to be watching that one very soon, Bo. Yeah, uh, it, yeah, it, it's like the Giallo, ready. Spoiler alert, red herring, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's a lot of that. There's the next episode there. There's going to be a lot more of me saying like, is that right? You know, of looking for verification. Um, because as much as I try to make sense of this movie, uh, the, the second one, I mean, I, I don't know that I'm entirely successful, but it, it does have some stuff going for it, uh, for sure. And, uh, and more importantly, uh, we are completionists by God. And when we talk about one missed call too, we are going to talk about the hell out of it. Hell uh, yeah. So, uh, Derek, in the meantime, uh, we'll be back in two weeks to do that. Uh, where can people find you and what you do? Sure. Uh, most of my shows as, uh, the listeners who do know this very Bostonian voice know, uh, <laughs> Uh, are on the Dark Discussions Network, where uh, I do. Uh, I'm the lead host of Cinema Attack, which I do with my good homies Matt and Doug Doubles, uh, where we talk about tons of cinema. We even do some J horror on there once in a while. We try to mix it up, do some action movies, some sci-fi. You know, we, we just did a video game run where we just did Rampage and Sonic the Hedgehog and Monster Hunter, which. 
Oh, speaking of fever dream movies, Monster Hunter. <laughs> really? I have I've danced near that flame, but I have yet to uh I've uh, yet to jump in. Let's let's just say this. Paul W. Anderson is definitely the Rob Zombie of video game movies. Uh <laughs> but <laughs> but anyways, uh you know, I'd also do there here with Miss Lacey Lou of Cut to the Chase. Uh, we just did an episode on Teresa's and Zombie Beavers, and we actually record our next another episode uh, in a few weeks from now, where we actually I'll announce it now. Fuck it, we're doing a catch or kill release and exists. Uh, we're doing like a found footage style episode, so look out for that in the future. And uh, also, uh, no more room in hell, which I do with the infamous Mike Merriman, the man, <laughs> the myth, the legend, Mike Merriman, and Mister Venom course uh which our next episode is actually gonna be my birthday special and should be out by the time this episode is out uh we are doing two films from the year of my birth we're doing witchboard and chopping mall uh <laughs> no no theme in particular just from the same year i'm like you know fuck it. i'm just gonna watch what i want to watch it's my birthday <laughs> hey, but those feel like they're of a stripe to me i i can yeah. I, I don't know that those are too unrelated yeah, yeah. One has a psychic hippie chick, and one has Jim Larnowski, who's like, have a nice day as the robot voice. It's uh, great. Yeah. Uh, hey, but, uh, I okay. really loved, uh, by the way, Catch Kill Release. Oh, good. I, I actually haven't seen it yet, so I'm oh. curious to know. I, I, one of my favorite movies of that year, I think that was, what, 2015? Is it that far back? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. I, May, it might be 17 or 18, but it, it actually made my top 10 of the year because I thought the, uh, the lead performance in it was so good. And, and it was just, it was so refreshing. I like, I watch a lot of found footage shit because I yeah. like the format, but it always does me wrong. <laughs> it's never a good idea, but I, I, do I, it I, anyway. I feel you there. I feel you there, man. I'm, I'm excited to see it now. You know, I was like, cause I heard, you know, some people be like, some of my circles were like, fuck this movie but then some of them are like i like this movie and i like to hear some people that i always respected you know, say it was good so that's good at least so i'll, I'll I'm, I'm more excited to check that one out I'll, I'll be curious to hear your thoughts on it uh because i i enjoyed that quite a bit um nice nice and uh finally uh of course on the legion podcast network our the show is kind of on a hiatus but check out the back catalog underwater kaiju from outer space where we give you those visions from monster land guys check that show out it's a fun time uh we do a kaiju movie a sci-fi toho takasaku movie and then we do an episode of ultraman uh fun stuff yeah absolutely get get some super senpai shit in there hell yeah uh all right great man uh thank you again for hanging out with me and talking about one missed call and um, like this is the easy one. It gets harder from here, but, uh, although neither of us have seen the third one. So that's exciting. Um, yeah, yeah. That'll be it's fun. Back burner for me for a while. even like when I had the DVD set, I didn't even watch that one either. I mean, I was just so angry at the part two after my last view. <laughs> I, yeah. I think that's the, the problem. Like, I think the next episode is going to be really mm -hmm. funny because I, I think after our love fest on this one, I think we're going to do a little bit of tea and off. Um, yeah. but yeah, I, I was kind of the same way where I was like, you know, I really want to watch, sit down and kind of watch this tri trilogy back to back to back. And I hit the second one and I was like, you know what? I'm good for a minute. Let me just yeah. pause. Let me just step away. And then I found out about the TV show and then that became my new quest is like, maybe I can avoid watching the third one by trying to find this TV show. <laughs> the you it would suck if we actually do find it, but there's no English subtitles. <laughs> That's the worst. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like there's enough of a subtitle database that we we could maybe get away with it. But worst case scenario, I will at least watch it without subtitles just to kind of get the idea of it. You yeah. know, like I I don't my my Japanese isn't nearly good enough to translate by ear or anything. Um, but you know, I might be able to get the gist of it. Yeah, you never know. Although I could just, uh, what, what was it, MXT? Was that it? And just overdub it for myself? 
this dude with like Wilfred Brimley, like, God damn it, the phone calls me, God damn it. <laughs> all, all these goddamn kids and their cell phones call me all the time. My own damn voice tell me I'm going to die or something. I ain't going to